Hello? Hi. Um, I would just like to welcome everyone to the second seminar in the series of seminars called CEOPS, uh, which is Psychology of Political Struggle. This is a collaboration between PIO, uh, Peace Research Institute Oslo, and PUG, which is Psychology Students Without Borders, and also the Department of Psychology at the University of Oslo. My name is Lisa, and this is Ayun, and we are from the Psychology Students Without Borders, which is a student organization that are uh, working towards increasing cultural knowledge among psychology students, and how this can be used as a tool in understanding the com contemporary challenges we face in our society. Yes, and um, this morning we are going to hear Jürgen Kalling and Nora Sveos talk about migration as a research field, as well as clinical work with refugees. And between Jörgen and Nora, we will take a five minute, minute break, so you can go to the bathroom or whatever. Um, and then we will leave about 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, yeah, um, Jörgen Kalling, he is a research professor at the Peace Research Institute Oslo. He has published numerous peer-reviewed articles and book chapters regarding research on migration. Um, some of his research interests are uh, theories of migration and trans transnationalism, border control and migra migrant fatalities, and undocumented migration and human smuggling. And he has also conducted um, ethnographic fieldwork and through statistical data and secondary analysis, he has engaged with migration to a series of countries in Europe. So uh, please welcome Jürgen Kalling. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to come here. It's always exciting to meet new audiences, to um, try to share the insights of things that I've learned in my research and to generate enthusiasm for the field of migration research, which I think is, is important. So, um, of course, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a migration researcher, but I am interested in this interface between migration research and migration themes and psychology and various aspects of psychology. So I've um, enthusiastically taken on this challenge of trying to build a bridge between the two from my side of the divide. And I'll start by saying a little bit about what migration research means from the perspective of a PRIO researcher, because we have a fairly well-established migration research group at PRIO. We've done <coughs> migration research in a fairly um, comprehensive way for about 10 years. And we have several topics that we work on. So I'll say a bit about those and then talk more in general about these different themes and the links with, with psychology as we progress. So the first thing that we've done research on is the actual migration processes, the question of who moves, how, and, and why, to understand how migration is uh, regulated through policy and the ways in which migration policies fail or create outcomes that were not intended or that perhaps don't receive the attention that they merit. We've also worked extensively on what we call transnational practices, which are all the things that migrants do that keep them connected with their societies of origin after they have migrated. And also things that people in the societies of origin do to keep in touch with the people who have left and now live in other countries. So I'll say a bit more about that as well um, later, about the specific content of that. And then finally, we work, I think, now increasingly also on issues of belonging and societal diversity. So in a country like Norway, where we have people with different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, um, how do we still have a society? And what are the challenges and opportunities of that diversity? So this is a field that's perhaps been more explored in Norwegian migration research already, the f issues of integration in various forms, whereas PRIO has developed somewhat something of a niche in the study of transnational practices in particular, and also the connections between the migration processes, the transnational practices, and the feelings of belonging after migration. And across these three themes, we have several 
cross-cutting elements that we're interested in regardless of the specific topic that we study. One of them being issues of communication and representations. So communication between migrants and the people they've left behind, for instance, but also the ways in which we in society communicate ag about migration issues and how migration issues are represented in the media, for instance, or in social media, um, who is doing that representation on behalf of whom, and, and so on. We're also interested in gender relations and family dynamics, um, and that's, I think all of these are in different ways connected to psychology, but, um, um, and I'll get, get back to that, but I think especially in, the relation, in relation to how families in Norway work, it's increasingly important that many of those families have some migration element. Uh, we also, we, did a, we had a strategic workshop just last week where we sort of discussed our different interests and discovered that actually many of us working on the different aspects of migration have a shared interest in the importance of everyday life experiences. So how do people um, actually relate to their feelings of, of belonging and relate to diversity in society, not in abstract discussions, but in what they do in everyday life. And likewise, with transnational practices, for instance, how do those links with people who live far away affect what people do on a daily basis? And we're also very interested in developing research methods and in the role of the researcher, the, the political role of, of researchers in a field such as migration, which is so contested, um, the research ethics of relating to informants uh, in difficult situations, and also developing um, methodological approaches that combine various um, methods or, or ways of doing research. Because I think although migration research um, is made up of, as a, as a field is made up of people from different disciplines, this divide between quantitative and qualitative methods that you also have very clearly in psychology is something that comes up regardless of the discipline, but which is also very good to try to bridge in different ways. So that's why we often try to combine ethnographic work, for instance, with um, some form of quantitative methods. And last but not least, we work, of course, at the Peace Research Institute Oslo, which has as its mission to do research on the conditions for peaceful coexistence between states, groups, and people. Uh, and I think many people associate PRIO with research on political conflict and people using violence to achieve political objectives, but peace research is, is much more than that. It is really about how, how we may live peacefully together uh, despite our differences. And that, regarding migration, for instance, is not only about people fleeing conflict, but also about all the conflicts that arise because of migration between countries, between people, um, and the ways in which migration might also contribute to um, sustainable and peaceful societies. So what we really want to be at PRIO is a center of expertise in interdisciplinary migration research. And I say interdisciplinary because it is really a field that benefits from a diversity of perspectives. So we try, I even though we all come with our individual disciplines and benefit from that, we try to be active in this shared arena where people from different disciplines come together around the shared interest in migration topics. Um, so one way of doing that, of course, is to, to, to publish our research in journals that deal with migration across different disciplines and to participate in conferences and other events that bring together people from different disciplines. And, I, and we've been quite successful at, at doing that. So if we look at which institutions in Norway do res interdisciplinary research on migration, research that's presented in context with people from disciplines, different disciplines. Um, PRIO is actually the one that has um, published the, the greatest number of articles in interdisciplinary migration journals, so more than the University of Oslo, for instance. Um, and it doesn't mean that these other institutions don't do migration research, but they tend to do it more within their own discipline. Um, and the bridge building that I talked about initially is very much about crossing these boundaries. So when we uh, 
meet others in these interdisciplinary arenas, whether it's in journals or conferences and so on, which are the other disciplines that we actually encounter? So I, to answer that, um, I could have just sort of tried to think and listen to my uh, gut feeling about who's missing. And we often complain about economists being absent from these arenas, but actually I had a feeling that psychologists are missing and that's a pity. So I looked at the last thousand articles from these three main migration journals and looked at the institutional affiliation of the authors. So many sociologists, political scientists, geographers, I'm a geographer, economists, anthropologists, people from psychology departments represented what less than 1% of the articles published in these journals. And I think that's really a pity because psychologists would have a lot to contribute in this field. So how might um, psychology and migration be connected? I think there are two main ways of connecting the two. One is that migration provides an important part of the context for a lot of psychological work, both clinical work and, and research. So when psychologists who, clinical psychologists in Norway meet someone today, there is a big chance that migration in one way or another plays a role in that person's life. So migration is an increasingly part of the context that people need to relate to as professionals, whether they're psychologists or, or teachers or doctors um, in Norway. So understanding migration as part of the context is one, one connection. And then the other connection that I'm also very enth enthusiastic about is the potential for psychological research to contribute to understandings of migration processes. And that's where I would have liked to see, for instance, more people with a psychology background participating in these interdisciplinary arenas for better understandings of, of migration. So I'll say first some things about this um, um, top connection, the co potential contribution of psychology to migration research, and then the other connection towards the end. So this is sort of the very, very simple picture of what migration is about. People in one country, possibly moving to another country. And the first question that we might approach is the issue that individuals face about, you know, should I leave or not? Um, and that sort of the, the core migration decision is a very, very difficult one that people face in a wide variety of circumstances. But regardless of this, almost regardless of the circumstance, it's, it's a very uh, decisive and difficult choice because you, you don't know what would happen to you if you stayed and you don't know what would happen to you if you leave and maybe you don't know as much about the place you might be going to as you know about the place where you're staying. But both choices involve a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and here I think is the first place where I would welcome more contributions from, from psychologists. I've worked quite a lot on this aspect of migration research and keep encountering issues that I imagine that psychologists could contribute a lot to. Others, um, people from other disciplines, anthropology, sociology, geography, and, and so on, have also related to the issue of you know, how do people deal with this uncertainty of making a decisive choice? Um, how, what are the roles um, played by hope and fear, for instance? Um, <coughs> But psychologists have not been very present in those, in those debates. It's easy to think of this as, a, as an issue of decision. So sort of the psychology of decision making could play a role. And I'm sure it, it can. But it's also a bigger question. Because migrating or not migrating is not simply about making a decision. Because if you are um, in, say you're in a conflict setting where you fear that if you stay, your life might be in danger. <laughs> um, you can't just decide that you will leave because borders will often be close to you. Um, so you have to weigh the pros and cons of, of staying and leaving and the, and the risks of both. And the difficulty of, of, of leaving, of course, is partly connected to the fact that borders are often closed, and more or less closed, which means that going um, to seek protection in another country involves great risks of its own that you have to weigh up against the, the risks of staying. But even if conflict and fear is not part of the issue, if you're 
if you feel that your life is stagnating, that you have no way of establishing a family of your own, that you have no way of earning a livelihood and you need to seek that opportunity elsewhere, it's also a decisive and very difficult choice. And as I said, uh, it's not as easy as deciding to go and then going, um, given the way migration is regulated today. So a lot of people throughout the world, especially throughout the developing world, have a wish to leave that they are unable to realize. So they're stuck in places where they don't want to be, and they feel that, you know, I really want to be somewhere else. I would like to migrate to another country where I would have better opportunities to be who I want to be. Um, and that's not possible. And what, what does that do um, to people's everyday lives, to their plans for the future, to their communities, when they're stuck in a place where they don't want to be? Um, so again, I think there's a, a potential contribution from, from psychology. And this is really, an, I think, quite an under-researched theme more generally, the potential um, effects of migration that hasn't happened yet, migration that exists in people's head as a future dream, but which is not being realized. And of course, all of this is not only about the individual potential migrants' um, thoughts and feelings, but also about their connections with others and the communities that they are part of. And so here, um, social psychology would play, could play a potentially important role. I've done some research in collaboration with a former PhD student, Tove Sagmo, on the role of rumors in migration processes, where we read a lot of social psychology, which is the field that's looked more, uh, most extensively at rumors as a topic. But that's also something that was generally appallingly under-researched, although um, we know that rumors are important in migration because people lack um, um, more sort of established traditional sources of information, so they, they need to get information where they can get it. And that is often in the form of unverified information that we would refer to as, as rumors. And also the issue of your, your um, say social standing or your image in relation to others is also affected by this possibility of, of migration. Say that you harbor a strong desire to leave, but you're unsure that whether you'll ever be able to do it? Is that something that you tell people around you or do you try to hide it because you don't want to seem like a failure? Or, um, and then do you suddenly leave when the opportunity arises? So those, or is it something that you actually don't want to do yourself but you feel that you should do it for the sake of others? So these mechanisms within families and communities are also incredibly important for understanding um, how people eventually end up migrating or or not migrating. So then if we um, say that this person um, decides to migrate and is actually able to realize it despite all the obstacles, then we face um, another set of questions related partly to the way in which ties are sustained after migration. Because it's not as if social ties are cut off when people migrate. They're stretched out in space. And that, of course, makes them different, even if they're still important. And that's what I mentioned initially with the, these transnational practices, things that people do that keep them connected. It's about flows of, of money, about flows of information, transfers of norms and values in both directions. So for instance, um, there is this random research looking at the possibly positive ways in which migrants can um, influence their societies of origin in ways that benefit development, for instance, in terms of gender equality or attitudes to corruption, um, but also perhaps consumerism and individualism and things that are not so good for the societies of origin. And likewise, we know that um, people who have migrated in their daily lives at the destination are also influenced by norms and values that are important in their communities of, of origin. Uh, so we often talk about this field as a transnational social field, and a social arena that people participate in, uh, that is different from their local social environment at the, at the destination. And again, um, I've also done research looking at this relationship between the people who have left and the people who have stayed behind. I didn't find so much research from psychology that was of use to me then, but I think there is a lot of 
of potential for it. Then I mentioned initially that this, the whole field of integration is perhaps the one that's received most attention in migration research so far, and also one where psychologists have been very prominent, even if much of it has been within the discipline of psychology. Uh, unfortunately, I think um, we tend to focus on integration as researchers because that's what the government is interested in, and that's where the money for research is, and also that's where we as sort of the majority society in a country of destination, that's our perspective on migration, that we, we want migrants to integrate so that they can be useful to our society. So the most recent government white paper on integration, for instance, was called From Reception Center to Working Life. That was sort of the, the mission. Let's get them to be productive from just sitting in these um, asylum reception centers. And of course, integration is about much more than that, but that policy agenda has quite a, a powerful impact on the, on the research agenda as well. But since we've worked so much on these transnational connections, we're also interested in how these two intersect. So how do, do the persistence of transnational ties intersect with integration issues? And that's where we feel that we have a very important message from our research, which is that uh, people often tend to think that, well, if you're more transnational, more oriented towards your country of origin, then you're probably less integrated, and vice versa. But in fact, um, people can be both, and they can be neither. So some migrants in Norway are passionately engaged in development processes, political issues in their countries of origin. They have houses there, they go on holidays, and partly they do that because they are well integrated here and have the material resources to, to have a house, to go on holidays. Uh, they have political commitments in the countries of origin because they're also politically active in their local environments here. Um, whereas others are marginalized in Norway um, and also um, don't have strong ties back to their countries of origin. Maybe they, they can't afford to go on holiday. They can't afford to bring gifts to all the people who expect gifts if they do go on holiday. <coughs> and they feel um, as if they failed here and don't want to expose that to people in the country of origin. Um, so we have, um, when we've looked at this, we find all sorts of combinations between people who are strongly or poorly integrated in Norway and strongly or poorly connected with their societies of origin. So here I'm switching to this other part, the context part. How does migration form an important part of the context for work in different areas of psychology, including clinical work? So we could think of migration as one aspect of everything you might know initially on a very superficial level about a person as you encounter them for the first time. So how then does migration matter to who that person is? And of course that's a highly individual question that will need to be asked and answered in each case. But I think one possibly fruitful way into this is to think about time and the temporal dimension and think that migration could matter in the present, in the past, and in the future. So often I think um, we think that, well, migration matters in the sense that some people come with a cultural baggage from their country of origin. And I think that's one of the most horrible metaphors I know, that sort of you carry your culture as a, as a baggage um, because it implies that it's something um, fixed, um, tied to you, that comes from another country. Um, whereas we know that culture is dynamic, is changing, you know, it's, it's different to be Eritrean in Norway from what it is to be Eritrean in Eritrea or, or somewhere else. Um, and also each one of us is not a product of our culture, whether that is being Eritrean or being Norwegian or being, being something else. Um, but of course people's pasts matter in different ways and if you've either made that decisive choice of migrating and either feel happy about it or regret it, or if other people have made that choice for you, obviously that's an, a, very, a very important part of your past. And uh, it could involve other experiences of, of trauma or separation or otherwise, either things that motivated migration or things that followed from the migration, for instance, uh, difficult flight, um, as in, fleeing to another country under dangerous circumstances. 
Um, it could matter in the present, partly if your, for instance, if your closest family members are far away and you have limited opportunities to communicate with them and you worry about how they're doing. Um, that's one important part of the present, but also the ways in which other people define you at present on the basis of what they know about your past. Because if, if you happen to be born in another, another country, you are a migrant for the rest of your life. Um, but maybe that is no longer so important to how you identify as an individual. And finally, I s started off talking about how people have dreams about migration in the future. And that could also be an important part of who they are at present and what they struggle with at present. So for instance, one, one uh, psychology study from Mexico looked at how suicide thoughts were associated with migration aspirations among young people. Um, and also we know that in a country like um, Norway, a lot of people experience extreme insecurity in their everyday lives because they know that at some point in the future they might not be allowed to live in Norway anymore. They might be, be deported. And of course that creates and can create an anxiety that many of us would find um, hard to understand. Um, so I think the context of migration uh, needs to inform how we think about individuals from a psychology perspective, but also psychology can contribute to to our understanding of migration processes. Um, so even though I talked about these two things separately, there is a sort of cycle there. I'll spend my last minute saying some things about the figure of the refugee, because I think the refugee is such a powerful figure in our imagination that it's also a dangerous one in the sense that we associate it with so we, we associate it so strongly with specific expectations of who a refugee must must be, and of course the refugee is a very clearly defined legal category, but there are so many different ways of being a refugee in terms of identifying as a refugee or not and having different types of experiences associated with the refugee um, status. Um, but we have to be a bit wary when we approach sort of the category of refugee that we don't um, deduce too much about what individuals might be like. And also how they might differ or not from other migrants. Because of course, refugees share a lot of things with other migrants in terms of having left one country for another, possibly being separated from people they care about and possibly living in a culture that's different from what they were used to. And many refugees, of course, have experiences of fear or trauma that they also share with other people. All the other people who experience those same things but were unable to, to leave. Um, the people who are still stuck in a place where they feel that they are in danger um, and where they've had horrible experiences but they have no way of, of getting out. And so that was a brief connection to the, to the next uh, themes that we'll, Noura will address after the short break. Uh, here at prio.org slash migration, you can see more about our research and also sign up to our newsletter if you want to keep uh, informed. So I, I would very much welcome uh, more connections between uh, migration research at Prio and psychology at the University of Oslo and hope that I've inspired that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting to get all this information about this very important area of research. So thank you. Um, all right, right now we will uh, take a short break, five minutes. So grab another coffee or whatever you like, but uh, we will start up again in five minutes. So yeah, be back until then. Um, yeah, so next up we are Introducing Nora Sveos. Uh, she will talk about migration from a psychological perspective. Um, Nora Sveos is an associate professor at the department at the University of Oslo. Her interests in research and teaching are linked to questions in relation to refugees, human rights violations, and psychological consequences that follow. 
Furthermore, she has also explored the possibilities for treatment and, re and rehabilitation in the aftermath of torture and other experiences of violence and loss. She has, among other prizes, received the Amnesty Human Rights Prize in 2009 for her work with refugees and asylum seekers and their right to treatment and rehabilitation. She has also published a great number of scientific articles and book chapters in this field of research. So please welcome Nora Sveos. Thank you very much. And, um, I must say, when I came here this morning, I had prepared myself in Norwegian. Um, so that's always, of course, a challenge. It may be because I'm a bit slow or get a number of emails and <laughs> try to keep track of everything. But it's, uh, it's both a pleasure and an honor to, to be here this morning. And I will speak in English, despite some of my slides will be in Norwegian. But having been so inspired by Jörgen, I don't know if I even get, get started with my first slide, uh, because there were so many associations during, during this process. But first of all, I want to say that I think it's a great thing for our field that Psychology Students Without Borders has been established. I think uh, it has been working very well in, in Trondheim for a while, and I'm very, very pleased to see that it's now firmly established here. And I think this is exactly what we need. And I think it's, it's, it is also a wonderful response to the challenges that Jürgen came, uh, came with this morning. I will come back to that. As a clinician myself, having been a psychologist for a very long time now, focusing absolutely totally, I think, on refugees, on migrants, on, on trauma, and on human rights violations. It's also a very good opportunity for me to speak to you as, uh, as the students here at the department and also other visiting people coming today about some of the experiences in the work with, with refugees and, uh, and asylum seekers. But just some words to, to um, to, uh, to follow up on, on uh, what Jürgen said. I think what he said about psychologists' absence in the study of migration is a very serious one. And I think he has not only encouraged us, but he has really challenged us to do something about this. At the same time, I've been thinking while you were talking, I was, you know, all the time, but what about this, what about this? I also think that we as psychologists have framed this area a bit differently. We haven't in, in in any way, written ourselves into the migration field because we have been talking about trauma, a lot about trauma, and this has to do with your slide about the, the person, person here uh, before leaving. Um, we have spoken a lot about stress, and just these last days I've been looking through, reviewing a number of articles, uh, also from Australia, for instance, on, on pre-migration stress and post-migration stress, but for some reason or another, this has not been published or presented in the context of migration, but in the context of stress, trauma, and, and, all, and mental health more specifically. And I think this is something we should do something with. Also, there seems to be a tendency these days that psychology is good psychology when it's published in psychological journals. To me, um, that's probably why I'm still an associate professor. Um, <laughs> I have the feeling that as much as possible of psychology into other contexts, into other areas of research, into other fields where this knowledge is absolutely needed. And, and uh, we have, for instance, one student here today, Raksan, who's sitting back there, who is now working in Oskid. She took a master's. You can, ri you can rise up just, just to we, so we see you for one second. <laughs> she was my student some years ago. She, she, uh, she, made, she did a master's here at the department on exactly the relationship between uh, the young accompanied minors here and their relationship to the families at home. Also Guri, Guru Omdal, who is doing a PhD on this issue, when she presented some of her research in the newspaper, our, our minister came up and said, oh yes, they're sent here to work in order to have the families coming. Uh, so that became a very serious issue. But I also to come back to Raksan's uh, study, she was looking at what, what are the expectations from those at home as to what the, the here living uh, youngster can do with respect to preparing reunion, preparing reunification, etc., and their own dreams about reunification. So again, uh, topics very related to what you're saying, but not framed in a way that probably would make it 
make the way through the, the magazines. But Roxanne, now you can re rewrite your, your master thesis and perhaps submit it to one of these journals. That would be a, a good thing to do. One of the things that I personally have been working with clinically for many, many years is the, the, um, the issue of expectations and hope when before coming and coming. Because that, I have seen this as a source of stress in itself. Um, I can just very briefly um, comment on one client that, we, uh, that I worked with for many years. He had been many years in prison in, in, in his country. He had been backbound, he had been tortured uh, over time, and he, all the time he was kept up with his idea about the day I come to Norway, all the things I'm going to do for my country. I'm going to speak to Jorhalem Brundtland, who was our prime minister at that time. He had all sorts of plan what he would do. He came, six years of torture, he was absolutely not in any condition to do anything at all. So when he was referred to therapy, it was for depression, not because he was tortured, but because he was not able to fulfill his dream in Norway. Also, one of the most active issues in family therapy with refugee families is, now we are here because you were working as you were. You knew all the time that working in opposition would endanger us all. If you had been just a little bit less active, we wouldn't have been here in this ice-cold uh, ice country. Or um, we spent far too long in our country, we were so stressed, finally I managed to get you convinced that we had to leave, but now you're just not collaborating anymore. I mean, this is a conflict that we as psychologists will deal with also in terms of family therapy. So yes, there's a lot to, to, to be done here, um, cross, cross thematically and also within the different context, and thank you again for challenging us, and those of you who are thinking both about masters who would have and PhDs, yes, feel, <laughs> feel, feel encouraged. So now I'll start talking about what I wanted to talk about. And I've probably spent half my time already. Anyway, what I wanted to say something about uh, is, is what we know about psych psychological health uh, and what we can do from the point of view of health as assistance to, to uh, refugees, and also what are some of the major topics that uh, regulate this whole issue. And my, my first point actually would, was going to be, when we are in work with refugees, and I'm going to speak about refugees more than migrants because that has been my field both clinically and, and from a research point of view. When we are working clinically with refugees, we very often deal with the same, some of the same psychological issues that we would do for any other uh, group we, we, are, we are working with. What are the differences that we have to be very aware of and that we have to be very conscious of is some of the contextual aspects that also Jürgen has described for us today. It's because the context is often different and the type of trauma that people have experienced is also different, so we should, we should know. And also there are a number of rights which regulate all our lives, of course, but in particular those who have fled, those who have left their countries, those who have been exposed to severe human rights violations already, it's very important that we, as their companions, as their therapists, as their partners in conversations, are aware of this broad field that is uh, accompanying them, so to speak, that forms the context of the situation that they are in. Because very often it is the path from arrival into the if I just now speak from a therapeutic point of view, the moment that they arrive to us as referred by someone, to the moment that we have a good working relationship, that path may often be long. And it should be long, because there are many steps to go and there are many important issues to deal with until you get to what we would call a working alliance. And we know from research that working alliance is very, very, it's a prerequisite for all good clinical work. And once we have a good working alliance, they know what we want to do together, we understand what they want us to do together, then we can work almost as if it was any, any other person that we are more used to, or many of you are more used to working with. So it's what we have to do is to be aware of the context, take that into account, and also be aware about the human rights uh, principles that surround this field in particular. So that's why I, as often as I can, in training, in courses, in seminars with you all, try to smuggle in the human rights perspective uh, as much as I can. 
So what is forced migration? We often speak about forced migration. It's about not being protected in one's own country. It's about not being able to go back. It's about long periods with insecurity, with fear, with violations and with threats, and also a hope for better for your life, uh, a hope for your life and your family. The Norwegian Refugee Council uh, de defines every year or presents every year the so-called uh, Flyktning Reinskape, which is a very good publication, by the way. And for, for the last year, they had 65.3 million uh, on, uh, who, are, who are refugees on the world, uh, on the world perspective, but we see that more than 40 million are refugees in their own country. That is the so-called internally displaced people. So you see that the group that has left, that has crossed international borders, are, is much smaller than the one who's actually living often very, very difficult lives within their own, life, within their own borders. And also the research on internally displaced people, there's a lot to be said about that. This could have been strengthened a lot. But here again, insecurity, fear, such things may be hindrances here. There are always a lot of dilemmas related to, to, um, to, to leaving, and we have already touched upon some of those. And, and uh, many people ex see this as, le as leaving their, their real life, even if they fear, feel that they're under threat and fear. Some people even experience it as, as being they are leaving the people behind. They're putting them down. They're not living up to their expectations by being. And of course, these are conflicts that are very active psychological conflicts also in the aftermath when arriving here. And in many of our conversations with people, it is about not being able to go back and bury my own grandmother, for instance. It's such a shame. It's such a pain. She's there. She's ill. Or my father or my mother. I'm not able to go back. I'm not able to have a contact with them. It's th dangerous for us to speak. So, of course, these things are ongoing stressors and also hindrances to be able to live a life that they want to do. And, of course, the, the flight in itself is, a, is an insecurity. And these days, of course, we're overwhelmed with pictures such as this. This was from the Bosnian War. But we have seen these pictures over and over again. And they are quite significant about what the risks are involved in, in, in fleeing. Today, there are a number of... Um, Detention centers for migrants, more and more. Hungary started one, started or passed a law just two days ago, defining all migrants coming would be applying for asylum or wanting to apply for asylum somewhere in Europe will be detained. I will personally myself next week go to Hungary to visit the containers where people are kept. So I'm quite uh, concerned about what I will see and what I will hear there. So why do people do seek protection? Why do they leave? It is, of course, they want a new and better and a more secure life. And sometimes also it is to save their own lives, to save the lives of their children. We often f hear families, refugee families say, our lives as adults is over. That's, that's not the big point. The point now for us is the children. The children can have a good life and that they can be able to, to keep up the traditions of our family, our values, our, our hopes for the future. So what do we know about the psychological health of the mental health of those who have left? And of course here I'm just opening, opening a huge, huge field of studies, of research, and there's a lot of interesting things out there. But it's also difficult to be on the reviewing side to see what, what is the message here. The main message is, as I will show, as I will show you in, in, a, in a while, in a short while, is of course that it's it's a risk of mental health. I mean, people are at risk for mental health distress more than others when they have been exposed to violence pre-migration. Migration, which is more and more being an issue in itself as a dangerous uh, thing to do. And of course, all the post-migration uh, challenges that people are facing. And again, I think we're living in a time now where we're going a bit back. It has been, it has been allowed to speak about the, about the walls again. Walls between countries, walls on the borders. It has, hate crime is being stimulated by this. Exclusion, uh, marginalization, and, and discrimination. And I think this is very dangerous. And we have to do as much as we can to prevent this from happening. Stop the surge of hate crimes, of discrimination, of exclusion of people who are arriving. 
It's as if even politicians these days say something that just some years ago would have been, no, 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 you don't say that in this position. Now they do it, and they do it with impunity, which is very, very concerning. Anyway, what do we know from, the, from, from this field? And, and um, the problem and the advantage, we can say at the same time, with all the research on mental health and refugees and asylum seekers is that it's all done at different groups, different times, different places, and with different aims. So for instance, we have studies done in, in Holland on the refugees or the asylum seekers at this center from two or three countries, then we have studies of people who have lived, for instance, in the U.S. for many, many years. We have those who have lived in Canada for many years, Scandinavia. We have different forms of studies, so it's always difficult to compare. And looking into some of the research results, we will find often a great variation of the type of, of numbers that are being, being, being mentioned. But I do think that looking through it all, and there have been some publications that have made, tried to do reviews on, uh, on what we know. There is a quite clear agreement that there is a high risk for, psychoso for psychosocial and mental health problems, especially the two first years after migration. And the traumatic experience seemed to have a big position, a big role to play in this picture. And the sad thing is that there seems to be not a very clear change in people's life from at the point of arrival to two years after and later. And of course, this is also something we have to do to do something with. And there again, of course, the asylum, from asylum seeker to working, to the working place may be a good one way to start because it has, it is of essence that people do feel that they have something to, some engagement in their lives. And one of the studies done by the Psychosocial Center for Refugees in 1996 actually showed that lack of, lack of training or any school or training programs or work was actually the a very severe predictor of mental health distress in exile. So yes, we have a lot of research showing this. So anything that can do be done in order to, inter to integrate people into an active, active life, whether it's very Norwegian or not so Norwegian, that doesn't make a difference, I think. It's, it's a matter about having meaning and having a direction in life after having lost so much. Because we're talking about people often in grief, they have lost, they feel every single day that they're losing something which is their meaningful context. And this, of course, we have to find ways of, of uh, dealing with, compensating, so to speak. So again, looking at some of the research that is, um, is available, post-traumatic stress is it's indicated between 20 and 40%, and anxiety and depression between 30 and 70. So you see the span is quite big. And there's a number, number of studies I could have referred to here. I mentioned what is problematic today and it seemed to be getting more problematic is the, the flight itself. Many, many years ago when the Vietnamese had to leave, they were in the boats, they, the boats sank, they were rescued, but then they were often taken safely to, to, uh, to research, uh, no, to, uh, to asylum and refugee uh, centers, which was in that sense a, way, a good way of doing it. Today people are being very, very exposed during the travel itself. So a study that was done by a doctor uh, looking at uh, those traveling through Serbia, because there are a number of people traveling through Serbia, they, he found that almost 30% were tortured in their country before they left, but more than 40% reported torture during the, during the way, including, of course, those who had been under, uh, in torture in their own country before they left. So we do see that this is a problem, and we will meet people who have not only been exposed prior to leaving, but during the way uh, their travel. And we have to try to find out about this. We have to try to know and understand how these things are. Some years ago, we made a report on psychological health in, in asylum, seek, asylum centers, trying out some of the more, some instruments in order to, um, to define and to, to map psychological health on new arrived asylum seekers. And we interviewed 65 people, not very high number, but we see that there was a high, num high percentage of persons who actually uh, fulfilled the criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder, and 34% also fulfilled the criteria for, a depress for, a depressional depress for depression and, and anxiety. So again, 
there was, and the interesting thing, we had used a number of different uh, tools, not only interviews, not only self, um, po uh, not only questionnaires, but also some, some uh, diagnostic procedure, which was much more difficult for, for the person to, to direct itself, because some people say, oh, of course they will put on their, their, their problems, because they want protection in Norway. And the thing is that they underreported, actually. We saw from some of, the, some of our interpretations, we saw a higher level of problems that they actively reported themselves in the interviews and in the questionnaires. So it was more an underreporting of problems than an overreporting, which is interesting. So we f there was also the number of uh, practically 80% feeling that they were close to be killed, and 67 who had experienced that their closed ones had been exposed to, 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 of course, serious violence. Also, a high number of rape, as you can see, also by men, and it's very seldom that rape of men is reported so clearly as we had in this report. So um, this is also something that we must take into account, and we also know now from more recent refugee studies that men having been exposed to sexual violence has become a probably we don't know if it's growing or, or if it's the reporting that is growing. Um, exposure to women has, of course, been known for many, many years. Um, it doesn't make it any easier to deal with, and it's definitely something we have to be aware of and prepared to do. So what's the psychological help that people can expect when they're coming to, to a new country? Uh, there's a lot here to be said, and I will probably not have time to cover it all, but the... Um, what is important for us to know about is that there are rights here to, to, be, to be met, to be given psychological and other forms of health care, especially when you live here, of course, but also when you come as an asylum seeker. And I'm referring here to, to a guidelines that was developed by the Directorate for Health and Social Affairs. And this is very important that all of you, uh, are, uh, that all of you are aware about, because here it says what rights people have. You have probably met, if you have been in, in praxis at, at the child care units or any part in the system that people say, oh, no, no, he doesn't have any right to be helped here because he's only an asylum seeker. This is not correct. If a person is referred to and someone has assessed that there is a need for psychological help and it seems to be quite a serious one, yes, they have the right to be helped even if they're asylum seekers. Not something that they, would, uh, that they can live with fairly well, um, but if it's something that is urgent, if, something, it's, if they're very in pain, they psychologically, nightmares, fear, etc., they are entitled to help in asylum, in, uh, in, in also in, uh, in, um, in the psychiatric units, even if they are asylum seekers. And especially, of course, with children. And many children, many asylum seeking children are being uh, refused or denied access to, to uh, Bukbir, and this is not correct. Because we do have, and Norway has an obligation to identify vulnerability at arrival, and in 2000 and not 2001, 2010, um, we published a report on uh, vulnerable asylum seekers in Norway and in the in the um, European Union. And of course, there is a very clear mandate on receiving countries to identify vulnerability and provide them with assistance and care, and also be aware of their special needs during asylum or during the, the asylum procedure. Also, in the light of the mass influx, because this is important, Norwegian authorities has used as a, uh, an excuse, I would practically say, there have been so many arriving, we cannot deal with this, we cannot have any good uh, psychological or mental health provision ready because there's so many numbers. Of course, this is a valid argument, but then the, the reply is not to deny, but to, to grow and to increase the level of assistance that is provided. And even during the mass influx now in 2015, several NGOs, international NGOs, among them the UNHCR, no, that's not an NGO, but IOM, uh, and um, they developed a guideline underlining specifically that even short stays, even with high level of migrants, there should be a very clear um, vulnerability assessment in order to be to be sure that people are being assisted if they have been exposed to severe human rights violations. And this is also in the direction, in the, in the reception directive of the EU, 
very clearly defined. I want just to say that one of the aspects that we as health professionals can do and be aware of in, in our work is to ensure that people who have been exposed to torture are actually being um, assessed. Because there is something called the Istanbul Protocol, which is a manual for assessment and documentation and investigation of torture and ill treatment. And it is, a, it is a very clear requirements on the parts of the receiving states to ensure that people who are tortured have been, are, are being identified, not only for them to have treatment, which they absolutely need and unfortunately in Norway very often do not get, but it's also a way of finding, to document and assess what they have done, what has happened to them, in order for them to have this, um, both for their asylum protection uh, application and their uh, post-conflict transitional justice mechanism and for any form of compensation or reparation that they could be uh, provided. So again, it's important for us to be aware of this. The, the prohibition against torture is absolute, and I could speak, as you probably know, I've been very much engaged in this prohibition and in the work against torture, both nationally and internationally, and it is something that we should be very aware of, and the, 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 the prohibition against torture is absolute, and torture gives us a lot of severe problems, and for us meeting them, either we meet them in a social care situation or a more therapeutic situation, we must be very, very, very conscious of the diff difficulties involved. So I will just very briefly end with two words about psychological torture, which we saw very, in some well, well refined also in some of the enhanced interrogation done in the US in relation to the war against terror, where also we see all these terms here we know from the psychology books sleep deprivation, um, humiliation, stress position, etc. all these different aspects are very known stressors which, which define or which c can complicate lives of people very strongly. I will stop with, this, um, stop with this at this point and I will be very ready to, to answer your questions and as I understood you would like to, to have the questions um, that we go all together. I just wanted to have one, one slide to, to end with, but this doesn't work. It's amazing. So I can go to the next one. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, this Okay. Yeah, we fix it. We fix it. Yeah. Okay. I think that they have advised me that my time is out, so uh, I will end at this note, but I would be very happy to... So thank you very much, Nora, for this really interesting psychological perspective. We have about only 10 minutes for questions, um, but first I want to inform you that this uh, seminar is being recorded, and you can find it at Prio's homepage, yeah? Um, so I think we maybe take two, three questions first, and then you can answer it all together. Is that okay? Anybody has a, have a question? Yeah. First. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was a PhD student in political science and sociology uh, in, in uh, Istanbul, from Istanbul, from Turkey. Now uh, I'm a refugee in Norway. Uh, we came uh, four months ago. Now um, I am uh, uh, and my husband. Uh, we are uh, staying at the Kasper Transit Motak uh, uh, near the mosque. Uh, I just uh, want to say, uh, uh, sorry, just I took uh, some notes because uh, in my mind there are uh, many things. Um, you you say it. Uh, psychology de department published only one percent of uh, of the study, all of that study about migration. 
but uh, we need uh, we need uh, the psychological more than the other more than the other department because uh, especially in the Aston uh, Center we need the psycholo uh, psychologist who really uh, um, listen uh, to your traumatic uh, procedure and the other things. Normally I am a political uh, scientist and I am a sociologist but uh, uh, really we <coughs> need uh, more psycholo uh, psychologists uh, uh, who study or who uh, want to listen to the people problem in the camp. Um, in the refugee camp, people never care about your uh, psychology, uh, psychology um, and it is uh, nece necessary to say <coughs> to you how important people's psychology, uh, psychology uh, rather than uh, other uh, needs. Um, and just, uh, I want to uh, just please uh, come, uh, come to uh, uh, camp and uh, just listen to people's problems. And I am already your uh, subject topics <laughs> before you come to camp. <laughs> I come uh, to tell my story. And uh, by the way, I'm the luckiest one uh, who uh, I can um, come uh, for the, uh, my studies at Oslo University. And uh, by the way, camp is really far away from the town. It's kind of in the forest. And uh, to take a bus uh, to... Uh, arrived in the center you need to walk uh, at least one hour it is uh, it is very in the uh, it's it's kind of sentiment it is really a very uh, bad condition and um, also uh, uh, people just I want to one example from my experience uh, I, I am married and I have some uh, health problem and I never a mother uh, but they spared us with my husband in the single room now I am uh, uh, staying with the single uh, ma uh, woman and my husband uh, he is staying with the um, single man and they said we are not the family because we don't have the children and there is no, mm. uh, and even in my country, ne uh, no one judge me in this way. And now I feel half, you know, as a woman. It is, it's normally uh, before arriving here, I, I didn't have this, some psychological, you know, the, like some like traumatic team, uh, things. But when I arrived here, when I heard these things, now I have, you know, some psychological problem, I feel. And also my husband in our culture, beyond all culture, all religion, now my husband actually he has some health problem. That is because of, but it doesn't matter. We are a couple and it is not our choice. And now he feels like lack, or lack of uh, manhood, you know. It is uh, other uh, terrible things. And uh, we called the many people to con contact with them for about our problem. The only things uh, the doctor said in the clinic, the first thing the doctor said, there is no empty room for you. And I said, I have a psychological problem. It's, it's kind of psychological problem, I am not sure. And the first thing I heard, there is no empty room. It is really dramatic. It doesn't matter Norway will accept us or not. But before uh, we arrive here, we love, we heard Norwegian people, even I haven't met a Norwegian one, just uh, we heard how uh, they are hospitable, uh, how they are honest, and how they are uh, justice, you know. After we arrive here, now we are thinking all, you know, refugees, we are thinking the way the personnel in the camp behave like us is kind of way Norwegian government be behave, you know, and the perception and sense of people changing in a bad way. I am so sorry for that, but it is not, you know, it's not preventable because the people think that if the people, some Norwegian think, uh, behave like that, then it is the way the Norwegian, uh, you know, Norway uh, behave like that, just because of this, because I, I love Norwegian people and I love that, because of the police just uh, visit the camp and just to be volunteer or other way, just come to camp and listen to the people's problems. Thank you very much. We also had a second question, so you can maybe answer them all together at the end. Yeah. Uh, that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say thank you very much for, for your presentations. I really, sorry, I'm also 
um, on the same page that uh, there's uh, so much uh, more potential and so much more need for the collaboration between the, uh, the field of migration researchers and um, psychology. Uh, I sort of have a, a comment, maybe more of a question, but um, I think in, in, um, in order to be able to, 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 to do it and to maybe form research projects uh, together, I think maybe there's also a need for an, a better understanding and openness towards the methodological issues. And uh, because uh, in, in the process I have been uh, sort of trying to collaborate also with, um, yeah, between the psychologists, I'm a sociologist myself, and I think there's a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of judgment on each other's on the methods that we're mm. using. So yeah, maybe it's a little bit off the off the topic. But <laughs> okay, maybe you will have some comments or answer the questions. We can wait until questions. the end. You okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Two minutes time. left. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, and uh, thank you so much for your interesting uh, lecture. I couldn't be here at the beginning, unfortunately, but I had a chance to listen to Noura, at least. Um, uh, my um, question is about, uh, or suggestion, is about uh, that when I was myself in a refugee camp for seven years ago, um, I'm a PhD student now here in um, psychology um, department. And the problem was that when I, when I wanted to um, um, meet a psychologist, it needs a very long um, process to get there. Like, for example, first you have to talk with your, um, the um, employees in the um, camp, and then you go to the nurse and talk with them, and then you go to the doctor, uh, and then you go to the psychologist. So in this process, you have to express yourself for four different, at least, four different people. And it's really, really bothering. And it's, it, it means lots of so, um, energy and lots of you. You know, you, there are stories that you don't like to share with anybody. So um, um, I wanted to ask you if um, it's possible to make it shorter and uh, um, the process to get to one, somebody that has uh, expertise to help on this kind of people. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Do you have any comments? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, and uh, thank you. Um, I know, Nora, that you've been working on this issue for a long time. It's more of a comment to, to your input about uh, the assessment of psychological health when you arrive uh, in Norway. So I was just uh, curious to know if there's any progression or change or anything in this field, because I think it's important mm -hmm. that somebody will listen to your story when you arrive. So that's my question. Thank you. Well, th thank you to all of you, and and, uh, and I mean, there, these are the issues that you're raising are just extremely important. And uh, at some time, at some points, I think now somebody somebody else has to, you know, there has we have to be more people doing this because we have been talking about the importance of being close to where it is mental health worker, whether it's psychologists or other persons who are especially prepared in order to meet people where they are, not go through this whole long process. So, of course, the, the strengthening of uh, and, and being present where things are happening is an issue that we, can, we just have to go on working on. I think the kind of uh, situation that you are in on, with the rooms and not accepting familyship uh, when you're two is just absolutely, completely un under not understandable. And uh, I just, I just listened to your to your story and to your strength, and I think you just have to go on saying honestly, this is just lack of respect not to put people together. Don't argue with the, with psychological problems. Argue with the basic right of being together. I think it's that would be <laughs> the best advice, and I really hope that you you manage. I mean, one thing is that you knew that next room would be okay, but yeah. And and Samira, yes, definitely, uh, it's very strange the process that people have to go in order to be, be assisted. And um, I would hope so much that we could be quicker to react and quicker to respond. And I think a lot of the problems that people will have will be just growing from the lack of having someone to speak to. 
So it just, it's not, we're not always talking about therapy. We may be talking about some people who can give some advice and can, can listen. And there's a lot of good people out there who are in that condition to do that. But often there's not even a good room to, um, to sit in. I just, finally, I just want to refer to another report that we made uh, some years ago on what are the good practices in the different asylum centers. And one of the good practices that we described was a nurse, mentally health trained nurse, who was on the spot and who had her door open, of course, locked when some, closed when someone came. But people said, it's so good to know she's there. I can just go there and talk to her and she will listen. And that was one of the very simple and very obvious good grep that we described in our report. So more of this. This report is 15 years old. Yes, I think um, probably our time is... Um, up on the specific questions where uh, I think Nora was in a, in a better position to answer, but I would like to end by saying I'm very happy about this uh, enthusiasm for the link between different aspects of psychology and different aspects of migration research, and uh, I hope that it can be the beginning of uh, both better services, of course, but also closer research collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and thank you so much for coming. If you found this uh, seminar interesting, we do, have, we do recommend that you go to an event on the 25th of April here at the Department of Psychology, where um, students will um, present their experiences with migration and also uh, present their disser dissertations or huvudopgave. So we really recommend that. And thank you so, so much to our fantastic speakers today. It's an honor. Thank you very much.